Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Have a great stream with somebody who you guys really like on the show. So I'm happy to welcome back Pedro Gonzalez. Thank you for coming on, man. Oh man, thanks so much for having me back. It's uh, it's good to be back. It's been too long. Absolutely. Of course, most of you guys already know about Pedro. He's, you know, editor over at Chronicles. His writing appears everywhere. He's been on pretty much every show on cable news at this point. Uh, but if you haven't, for some reason, make sure you're checking out all his stuff. Now, Pedro did a report, uh, which I think is really good because a lot of times, you know, we see these clips, we see everything that's going on with the media. We see all the hype, lives, lives, lives of TikTok, all this stuff. The outrage on on cable news channels but it's really good for someone to go through and kind of put this thing together kind of weave together what's going on in this case uh pedro was talking about the transgender leviathan it's a report you can check out over at american principles project i think you also did a uh, a separate uh, article on uh, somewhere washington examiner or somewhere i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Okay, great. So if you want to read the report for yourself, you can check it out there or you kind of want to get the, the shorter version with the uh, article, you can check that out. But in this report, uh, Pedro does a really good job of, exp uh, of explaining kind of not just the nature, uh, the ideological nature of this movement, but he also follows kind of the structural and monetary parts of the movement, which I think are really important for people to understand, because man, I think a lot of times it's really easy for people to get stuck in the shocking nature of what's going on and not understand kind of the mechanisms that are driving a lot of what's happening here. But uh, to go ahead and uh, get started here, Pedro. Let's look at the beginning. You talk a little bit about patient zero and why it's important to understand kind of where this movement came from. Can you lay that out for people real quick? Yeah. So patient zero for trans kids in the United States was a man named David Reamer. So David Reamer, the story is always a little bit difficult to tell because David Reamer had three names throughout his life. He was born Bruce Reamer. He spent the first 15 years of his life living as Brenda Reamer. And then at the age of 15, took the name David Reamer. And so David Reamer was the subject of a radical experiment called the John Joan case by an influential psychologist and sexologist at Johns Hopkins University named John Money. Now, Money was a really interesting character because, in, like I said in, in, in my report, and in, in, uh, my, I actually published two pieces based on the report, one in the Washington Examiner and one at my substack at contra.substack.com. And the piece that I published uh, in my Substack focuses on, on money. So money was interesting because he was influential, like I said, in the field of, of psychology and sexology. But the thing about money was is that he was a really good marketer. He was really good at using the media to spread his ideas. And that seems to be the consensus around him is that this guy was not necessarily known for really sound, solid clinical work, but more that he was just capable of using the media to, to spread uh, the, the things that he was arguing and, and saying and insisting. And so Money was really trying to prove a general theory about humans. He is most known for his research into intersex conditions. These are people that are born with basically both uh, sex organs. Uh, and, and he wrote a dissertation on this, but, but he was actually really more interested in proving a general theory about humans. And that is that the, the main factors that make up our identity uh, have more to do more to do with nurture uh, than nature. And that, that's again, that's really the kind of the elemental drive behind someone like money. And in the 60s, he, he had this, I don't want to say it, uh, it, it's not really luck because obviously David Reamer would not say it was it was luck for him. Yeah. But but it was interesting because money basically said it would be completely unethical to perform a sex change on on someone like this, uh, someone born with normal uh, sex organs, that it would really have to be a kind of accident of nature that would allow someone to perform the, a, a radical experiment like this, because at the time it was still taboo. And so that ended up happening uh, in, in the 60s. Um, Bruce Reamer 
uh, when he was right after he was born, he underwent a circumcision that was totally botched and it severely damaged his penis. And his parents, in their desperation, had heard about money through the media. They had heard about the stuff that he was doing with with sex reassignments and with people uh, born with you know these odd uh, physical sexual conditions. And I, I, this doesn't really make sense to us uh, because you know we're, we're we're standing at the bottom of the slippery slope looking up. But at the time, the parents hoped maybe that if their son uh, could be transitioned into a girl, he could have something of a normal life as long as he never knew that he was born a girl or a boy. And so the family met with money uh, after hearing about the stuff that he was doing in the media. And they, they asked that question. If we transition him, or first of all, can you transition him to a girl? And second of all, will he have a normal life? And of course, money was money was enthusiastic about this because this is exactly what he had said he'd been looking for, right? This kind of freak accident. Because Reamer uh, also had a twin brother named Brian. So this is this is even better, right? Because now you basically have two subjects that you can experiment on. And the family, the Reamers, were initially kind of hesitant. Uh, you know, they, they were hopeful, but still reluctant because this is radical, right? This is never, this has never been done. This kind of surgery on a, on a child had never been done before. Not one born with normal sex organs and all that. Um, but money badgered them. Basically he accused them at one point of procrastinating. Um, again, very similar to today, right? Like you need to transition your kid as soon as they exhibit any kind of confusion about their bodies. Otherwise you're putting them in danger. And so money badgered them and eventually they, uh, they, they gave in and they, and, um, so at 22 months old, David Reamer, uh, had his penis and testicles removed and had rudimentary female genitals constructed by money and took the name Brenda, uh, as part of the John, the, it was called the John John case to protect the identities of David and Brian. Um, and as part of the experiment, Brenda was never told, uh, that Brenda had been born a boy. And so, so Brenda was given girls clothing, was raised as a girl. Uh, the, the family treated Brenda as a girl, all, all the friends did as well. It was, it was part of this whole experiment, right? But this is where it gets really uh, horrific. As, as part of this whole, we're going to turn you into a girl thing, money believed that it was necessary for kids to basically be exposed to like pornographic and sexual material as part of affirming that what he called their gender schema. Again, kind of prefiguring what we see today, right? Yeah. Looks like gender gender queer showing up in high school and middle school libraries. And what is the argument for these uh, graphic novels that depict you know queer sex and stuff? The argument is that uh, kids need this stuff to, to 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 learn about sexuality to affirm their gender schema. So money was ahead of his time in a lot of ways, unfortunately. Um, and so as part of that, money would actually have the twin brothers. Uh, basically simulate sexual acts and so he would for example have brenda get on his couch at his office get on uh, on his, on brenda's knees and then have brian and they're six years old at the time keep in mind so two six-year-old brothers doing this stuff brenda on on brenda's knees and then brian would be instructed to come up behind brenda and simulate uh, sexual acts and then in one case uh brenda was instructed to lay on brenda's back and then money told Brian to lay in between Brenda's legs. And according to Brian Reamer, uh, on at least one occasion, money photographed him doing this, took a Polaroid picture of them simulating these sexual acts. And if the kids didn't want to do this stuff, whether it was performing the sexual acts or um, inspecting each other's genitals, as instructed by money, he would snap at them. But around the parents, he was really nice. Uh, but, but in private, he would bark at the kids if they refused to do any of this stuff. This is all documented in the book. I draw heavily from this book, called As Nature Made Him. It's by a journalist named John Colapinto, who uh, really did most of the work in exposing this stuff in the 90s. Uh, I think the, the first big article was in Rolling Stone. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, this sounds insane. Maybe not today, actually. Yeah. Uh, right. But, I mean, it's, it's horrific, right? And Brenda was miserable throughout Brenda's entire adolescence. Like, never took to being a girl, and in fact was actually the more dominant of the two twins, and was basically a tomboy um, and just, but always suffered emotionally, academically, socially, just always felt like there was something wrong. And then finally at 15, Brenda finds out actually you were born a boy. 
and took the name David because he he identified with David from from the Bible because he, he had felt like he'd been up against Goliath his whole life. And uh, when the truth came out of the John Joan case, which money had marketed as a total success, it was promulgated as such by the New York uh, Times Book Review. Um, it, it was it was concretized in all kinds of medical textbooks as this example, you know, where we were able to use scientific techniques to change a boy into a girl and improve their mental and physical health outcomes. Like it became a kind of, um, it was described by one of money's academic rivals who helped expose this stuff as a kind of religious totem that even when the truth came out, that this thing was a complete failure and money lied about it uh, in a book that, that this experiment became central to, um, even when it was proven that all of this from the beginning was a lie and money knew it, the, the people that really believed in the John Jonah experiment would not accept that it was that it was a failure. He, uh, I think his, his, his last name is Diamond. I can't remember his first name. Um, but this rival of money said that people believed in the John Joan case with a kind of religious fervor. Like you could not dissuade them that this was a failure. And money went to the grave insisting that all of the criticism against him was actually just um, conservative uh, bigotry, and and that of was course. yeah, of course. Um, and so David tried to live a normal life. He, he got married. He adopted kids. But in 2004, after struggling with depression for his entire life, he committed suicide. He shot himself in the head with a shotgun. Uh, two years after Brian Reamer had overdosed on antidepressants. And of course, there's all this speculation. Well, okay, David was like having problems with his wife. He was struggling financially. It's like, hmm, I wonder what the root cause of all of that trauma was, right? I wonder what the root cause of, of Brian Reamer's depression was. I mean, it, it makes you angry that, that, that people actually try to like complicate this more than it more than it needs to be, right? And like I said, money went to the grave, um, basically insisting that he was just, you know, the target of, a, of the latest social conservative outrage. And he enjoyed uh, NIH funding for his entire life. And I think that's a really key thing here. Um, well, there, there, apart from all the, the sexual stuff, there are two key things. One, is, and I note in my report, is that... Yeah, one, sorry. Well, just one uh, second before we dive into the, to yes, the, yes, to the rest of this, because I know you've done a lot of work on this and you're prepared to lay it all out. But I just that there's a lot of information there I want people to process yes. for a second. Yeah. So you, what you're saying is from the very beginning of this movement... From the very beginning, from the very genesis of this, we see both an ignoring of the scientific facts surrounding it. We the the fail, the the story about what happened, even though once it was proven false, continued to be perpetuated because it needed to be for the movement yes. to continue. Yes. That's right. And also at the very beginning of this, we see the presence of exploitation of children, like yes. not just not like direct predation and enforcement of kind of this deep sexualization at a very early age of these children. Yes, that's right. Um, and and, and I, I saw that, you know, someone in the chat there, they're saying, yeah, the, the, I'm legitimately uncomfortable watching this or listening to right. this. And I totally understand guys, you should be like, yeah. this is horrific. Like Pedro yeah. had said, but at the same time, you can't look away because this stuff is, is continuing right. Full force. Yep. This is now a, a full scale industrial industry, which is what Pedro is going to explain a little more here. So, yep. sorry, I interrupted there. You were no, talking no, about I was, I was, in the, my mind. I was like, man, I'm going on and on. Um, <laughs> no, that's right. And there are so many aspects of this case that prefigure everything that, that we're kind of swimming in today down to the fact that, that, you know, even when we could prove that the John Joan case was a failure, people refused to accept that. Uh, it's one of these things, I mean, you, you see this all the time, right? Maybe a, another example of this, not, not related to transgenderism, but just this kind of idea of, of how myths are more powerful than facts, is, is this the, the, the whole narrative that, that Trump said that there were good people on both sides or something like that? Remember at Charlottesville? Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't remember the specifics of it, but basically the, the, the lie is that Trump was explicitly excusing like Nazis or something like that. And uh, it, although he, I think, condemned them or something along those lines, but he you did. get it. But yeah. the point is, is that he was being he's being accused of saying something that he didn't say. And although there's literally like, you know, video evidence of the fact that that's not true, it's still true. Like people will still talk about it today. I think you you often comment on this like that. Maybe that's that's one example that I just gave. But I think you've you have pointed out other examples where like, you know, although we have tons of evidence that a leftist narrative is totally false, it just continues to be true. And it's re repeated enough times that it becomes true. And I think that's, that's, 
Um, that's something that you saw with the John Jones case. And then also when people were confronted with the facts, they just, no, I, I believe that this is true. I believe that basically we've developed the scientific, scientific techniques to turn men into women and women into men. But a, another aspect of this is that, um, again, trust the science, right? Well, one of the drugs um, that was used as, as an effeminizing hormone for David Reamer um, has, is no longer used as part of the, of the process of transitioning because now we know that there's tons of evidence that it actually, in, it actually increased the likelihood of, 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 um, of um, cardiovascular disease, uh, blood clots, sorry. Uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's, uh, it's a very common uh, feminizing hormone. Uh, I, I wrote about it in my report. And I, I can, it's uh, ethanol estradiol, I think. I, I, I might have butchered it. Um, but, but basically, we no longer use it because we saw actually in transsexual patients that it dramatically increased the likelihood of pe these people coming down with blood clots. But at the time, it was like a, you know, like a wonder drug that we gave to these people to turn them into, in the case of like David Reamer, to turn them into a girl. And again, that's something that you see today, right? Uh, like drugs like Lupron. Um, there was an article in the New York Times recently about, about puberty suppression for trans youth. And by the way, I, I, I didn't share that article because I, I didn't care that the New York Times was saying that because it's like, you're a little bit late to the game, yeah. New York Times. Also, you helped spread this. Like the New York Times was part of, of this whole John Jones thing, right? So I, yeah, I, that's why I don't celebrate when outlets like the New York Times will kind of half-heartedly criticize this stuff. Well, that's part um, of the game, right? Like it's the right. same thing they did with COVID. They push yeah. totalitarian, horrific stuff. They you know uh, destroy the lives of people and they damage yeah. children. And then they go back two years later and they start writing uh, stories about oh, you know the 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 uh, ability of of underprivileged children to learn has been permanently. It's like yeah, because yeah. you made this happen, right? Yeah, but because right. they get to control the information, they get to play both yeah. sides of the dialectic. They get to yeah. advance yeah. the whole horrific thing but they get to blame it on other yep. people and then they go get to go back and take the side of the victims that they created at the end of the whole process yeah, yeah. well actually we can get to lupron later but i'll just i'll just mention that basically this drug that was used to effeminize uh david reamer we no longer use it because it's dangerous uh for for, for these types of treatments right and it's the same thing with modern drugs that we now use in place of that, like Lupron, which we can get into later. But the second aspect uh, uh, that we can take, or the third aspect that we can take away from the John Joan case is the fact that a lot of John Money's work was funded by the federal government through the NIH. And I think this is important because, yes. like you said, we want to dismiss this, right? Like, well, it's, it's a culture war issue. It doesn't affect me. They're going to actually, it doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant if you don't want anything to do with this issue because it's being funded with your money. Mm -hmm. the, the people that are conducting research arguing that one, um, children who want to transition but can't because their parents won't let them should be taken out of those homes under court orders. The same people that are doing that research, like John Money, are, are doing the research with NIH grants. So you don't actually get a choice here. It, there is no opting out of this whole thing. Like you can pretend that it's not happening or you can, you know, I, there are other things that I want to worry about or whatever, like pocketbook issues. Uh, well, this is actually being funded with your pocketbook, w whether you like it or not. So those, well, are, those are kind of the three major lessons from the John Joe case. Well, and it, it tells us, especially like you're talking about with that funding, that this is not some kind of fully organic movement, right? This is not right. some, ground up, you know, uh, groundswell of people who felt this and, and this was moved along. This was actively funded by yeah. politicians. This was this was this cause was advanced, particularly by people who wanted to see it move forward. They wanted this to be an option so that they could uh, you know, advance this agenda. This is not some random thing that just popped up out of the ether. It's not some organic cultural movement that occurred because of some change in the zeitgeist. This is a top-down manufacturing of a situation funded yeah. with taxpayer dollars. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think what's astonishing is that because you often hear this, well, like how many trans people are there in America? How many trans kids are there in America? Uh, a lot more than just like five or 10 years ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's actually growing at a really alarming rate. And on the one hand, that's kind of this like, um, this kind of tactical indifference, right? 
first we don't care about it because it's a non-issue and then once it becomes a big enough issue then we have to pass laws to guarantee people's right to transition at an earlier and earlier age and i think one of the reasons why that logic is so pernicious is exactly that yes the the rate of of minors who identify as trans and i i write about this stuff in my report um it has increased dramatically in a short period of time but if you look carefully at the data, most young people who experience gender identity disorder, what we now call gender dysphoria, most of these people, uh, their, their confusion, their dysphoria will, will, will resolve on its own. So a boy will end up being a boy and a girl will end up being a girl, unless you begin the process of transitioning them. And again, we're always accused of, of wanting to like under uh, subject people to things like conversion therapy, right? Which is this, this idea that we want to like elect, like Mike Pence, electrocute people, zap them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, well, puberty suppression, the first part of the transition sequence, like survey after survey and, and data set after data set show that basically once you begin the process of suppressing puberty, which is followed by administering cross sex hormones and the medical uh, surgical interventions like mastectomies, once you begin the process of su suppressing puberty, the, the likelihood that a kid is going to go on to the next stuff and each step is more irreversible and destructive than the last, the likelihood that they're going to move forward increases dramatically. So whereas you, you have, you know, a generation of young people that are kind of understandably confused about their bodies, but ultimately they'll be okay, you know, they'll, they'll make it out. The moment that you introduce like stuff like puberty suppression, then the chances of them moving on to these more destructive steps dramatically increases. And that's why that whole logic of like, well, what's the big deal? Why do you care? That's why it's so pernicious. And I think oftentimes it is, if it's not in bad faith, it, it comes from a, just an ignorance of, of, of exactly how dangerous this stuff is and how top down it is. I think it is bad faith. I think it is directly bad faith. I think it's people who want to treat the body like meat Legos and they want to treat the identity <laughs> of people as if something, because we hear this all the time, right? Like people say this as if it's not some horrific, uh, you know, Frankenstein thing they're just throwing out there. Oh, you know, if they, if you, if you get a mastectomy, you just get, you just get, you know, they get yeah. could put back on if you change your mind, right? Like, oh, this yeah. is something we can just go back and do another surgery as if there's no physical, mental, emotional spiritual cost to yeah. people by just completely rending apart the things that make you a human and make you who you are right i think yeah. these people like you said I, I the this each step in the process commits these people to something deeper and deeper and i think that's a feature not a bug right yeah. because they know uh that not only are they going to get customers for life not only is big pharma going to get customers for life who are going to be massive profit uh, centers uh, for these people, but they also know they have political foot soldiers for life. Because yep. once you've made that kind of deep ideological commitment at, at a very young age, that's basically irreversible. Where else are you going to go? Right? Like what else are you going to do? I think, I think this really is very malicious. And I think that it, uh, people who are treating it as no big deal or something that can just be fixed with a, a minor surgery or, a, 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 you know, just suspending, you know, some kind of medication. It's absolutely pernicious. It's not, I don't think it is, in, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are people out there uh, who are just parroting back the talking points who are trying to do it in some kind of good faith, but I don't think the people pushing it are at all. No. Um... And that's exactly a, a, a central point to my report, which is that I, I go over all of the different data and all of the different studies, or at least the major ones that kind of lay the foundations for justifying these treatments in young people, um, like the Dutch protocol, for example. And I go over all of these things and I show that either they're fundamentally flawed from the beginning uh, they don't apply to the, to the current populations like the, the Dutch protocol um, or they're proven outright wrong later. So, and I think you can see that that's true, not just because it's obvious with, you know, you have eyes to see and ears to hear, but also when you look at England, Finland, and Sweden, we often make fun of Europeans because we think that they're weird, but they're actually either sharply curtailing these medical interventions for minors or stopping them altogether because they're realizing exactly that, like this stuff is insane. It's dangerous. And the consequences of it, of, of these treatments are often irreversible. Like we're scarring young people for life, but the United States is going full speed ahead. And so what I argue is, is that I think 
part of this, because obviously my report is about transgenderism, but I think it, it's part of a it's part of a system or a part of a, a larger issue, which is a healthcare system that does. I mean, this sounds like a lefty talking point, but it's totally true. A system that runs on profit. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, because that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about transgenderism. You're talking about, you know, someone who does like a, someone who's doing female to male transitioning and it needs a double mastectomy, you're talking about thousands of tens of thousands of dollars just for that one treatment, right? And that's not even getting into hormone therapy, which typically is like a lifetime thing and costs thousands of dollars per visit to the clinic, depending on what your insurance looks like, or if you have insurance, you're you're talking about a lifetime consumer for the, for the medical industry. And I think that's that's probably a huge reason uh, why this is not, I mean, it is, and I argue this, but I'm saying this larger issue of how the healthcare system is set up in the United States. But I, I argue in my report that that is, that is a driving factor. Uh, it's a factor, it's not the main factor. I think it's important um, to note that oftentimes interest, the, the monetary aspect and the structural aspect um, will align neatly with what basically true believers want. There, there mm-hmm. is a kind of confluence basically between ideologues and interest groups. And, and behind ideologues, often you, you can find, you know, an interest group that is happy to make this crazy person in San Francisco uh, their, their mouthpiece because they really believe in it. But at the same time, uh, that you know, like Lupron that manufactures the, uh, or sorry, AbbVie Pharmaceuticals, which manufactures Lupron, uh, the top, or it's, it's one of the top two drugs that's used in puberty suppression. Um, there's a reason that, that AbbVie uh, will pay doctors to travel around the country and, and talk about Lupron Pediatric. And, and oftentimes when you follow the money, like I did in my report, you can connect uh, doctors who are, I think, actually true believers to uh, pharmaceutical companies like AbbVie who are also paying them to, to go around and talk about why Lupron is perfectly safe for kids. Yeah, I think that that's a really important point because a lot of people will just point to the ideology or just point to the money. And it's really important, you know, Gaetano Mosca said that political formulas require the, the it's you it's not enough to just have naked power or interest out there most of the time. There most most people need to have an ideological investment. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that these things don't interact. They do constantly motivate each other. The ideology motivates the profit and the profit motivates the ideology, but it's not enough to go around and just say, well, these people are cynical profiteers or go around and say, well, these people are only true believers. There is both. It is always both the material motivations and the ideological motivations. They work hand in hand. They feed back to each other, right? It's a, it's a closed feedback loop that accelerates this kind of stuff. And on top of that, I think it's really important to note that, you know, you talk a lot and we'll get deeper into this, I'm sure you talk about the big medical, but we have to remember and, and, you know, patronage theory of politics here, shout out to the good old boys, Um, you know, the patronage theory of politics here, every part of the civil rights revolution for the left comes with patronage. Every bit of this, the reason they always need a new cause, the reason they always need to find a cause du jour is that every time you switch the cause, every time you further the revolution, there's a whole new set of people who get paid. There's a whole new infrastructure that needs to be swapped in, not just on the medical side, but remember, these people are writing books. They're going out and giving lectures. They're creating lesson plans for schools. They're creating action plans for corporations. They're giving speeches to these people, corporate Gigs. They're doing all of this stuff. Yep. All of this, all of a sudden, this thing just goes from being surgeries and these people making lots of money in the medical realm to being an entire industry spread out across every aspect of our culture, and all that filters back to people who are supporting a specific ideological political side. No, yeah, yeah I mean, you don't. You that doesn't even get into the kind of like enforcement or safety structure that also has to to. Yeah. to go behind this stuff like i mean we're all aware of the fact that the fbi and the doj are you know monitoring parents that show up to school board meetings to protest this the basically the the promotion of trans ideology in k-12 education right like these people are viewed as as kind of like terroristic threats um there have been pediatric associations that have basically asked the federal government to step in and and stop people um like me or par- or concerned parents from criticizing them and uh, under of course the 
the pretext that somehow this uh, exposes them to like actual threats or something like that. I mean, all of this really just amounts to a gigantic jobs program. Um, like you need administrators, you needed for, uh, enforcers, you need social workers. Um, I, there was a parent who, when I was I was talking about this at a at, on a panel in, in Washington D.C., and when I started talking about how the courts are increasingly getting involved in this, she actually um, she made me want to look into this this other topic even more. But, but basically, she said that there's also a kind of incentive system for for the courts to get involved and to work with social workers and physicians and this stuff. And she laid it out for me because she said she's had to, she's she's dealt with this stuff as, as someone who's involved as an activist on this front. And it was just fascinating because I never thought about that. Um, and it's funny because like, you know, the left will talk about the incarceration system and how it like it's for profit and like the court system, prisons, it's yeah, for yeah. profit, but somehow they don't talk about the weaponization of the courts to, to separate children I mean, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. I, I know that they don't talk about it because they don't care. Uh, it's, it's different rules for different groups of people. But it's just fascinating because you you really, I mean, that, that's why I called my report The Transgender Leviathan, because it's 10,000 words, 40 pages long, but it's still just a glimpse of the problem. And and really, like, the more steps you take back, the, the vaster its size and scope becomes, and you realize that all of the attempts to kind of dismiss this and, and to downplay it, they become increasingly absurd when you realize just how massive this thing is. Well, and you document the the specific funding corruption of science, right? The same people who would say, well, of course, you know, cigarette uh, companies pay off scientists to discover that cigarettes don't cause cancer are more than happy to fund the people who discover that, you know, these drugs don't have any ill effects or, you know, are, or, or it's in some way beneficial to yeah. those who are in theory transitioning yeah yeah uh there was there was there's a doctor in, in my report who in 2009 told the chicago tribune uh about the benefits of puberty that lupron deprives users of uh that range from bone density to reproductive health so this is in 2009 hmm. and in 2010 the same doctor uh authors a study that submitted to the FDA on Lupron's use uh, among children. And people noted that this study conspicuously omitted some of the more serious side effects of Lupron. Uh, well, it turns out that if you look at, um, there were two databases that I use. One is a now defunct ProPublica database uh, that tracked basically uh, doctors who receive money from or doctors and medical associations that receive money from pharmaceutical companies. And there's a newer database and I use both of them. And what I found was is this particular doctor who in a short period of time went from like this Lupron is actually a pretty serious drug with serious side effects to, you know, authoring a study that omits some of the more uh, egregious side effects. Well, the guy had received hundreds of thousands of dollars from AbbVie specifically, uh, or specifically for Lupron, for this drug. And when you actually look at this newer database that I cite, and, and which provides more granular data, you can see that the guy had received tons of money specifically in connection to Lupron uh, Depot Pediatric, which is the drug that's used for kids. And so again, like that doctor might be a true believer. I have no idea. He probably does believe in this stuff now, right? Because I think if you, if you um, there, there are two things that, that can happen. One is you can start being a true believer, or two, you can say the lie enough times you'll start to believe in it because there's also money involved. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's my central point is that this is there is an infrastructure to this um, that that makes that is precisely why this issue is not slowing down. And another example is a doctor uh, that's based out of San Francisco. His last name is Rosenthal. And he recently wrote an article, I think for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, about a bill in Idaho that uh, if it would have been signed into law, it would have completely banned um, transition therapy for minors, puberty suppression, cross-sex hormones, medical, uh, uh, surgical interventions. And again, this doctor probably actually believes in this stuff. He, he argued that these treatments are life-saving. He said they're nothing short of life-saving. He probably actually does believe in that stuff. But he's also received money from uh, from 
from AbbVie Pharmaceuticals in connection to Lupron. And I also found that his research into early medical interventions for trans youth received a $5.7 million grant from the NIH. So I'm sure that Dr. Rosenthal in California probably really does believe in this stuff, but there's also you know a good amount of money and, uh, and employment involved in, in, in promoting these ideas. And again, I think that's why it's not slowing down. So Pedro, are you telling me that scientists and the peer review process are not some kind of holy sanctification that means that their words are the unchallengeable writ of the deity that then can lead us to the correct moral conclusions in all cases. No, That's I'm very sorry. confusing. I've, I've been informed <laughs> otherwise. I don't. The, I, yeah, no, I, I, I love this stuff because it, it's, it's kind of fun to be in our position right now uh, because we're in some ways we're occupying the kind of like, you know, the, the muckraker uh, position that the left used to occupy in terms of kind of looking at, you know, how power really works in this country. Um, then it's just hilarious because it just shows how fraudulent uh, the left is as, as a supposed countervailing force and check on power. It's, it's not that at all. Um, a, a, another good example of this is earlier this year, the, the Biden administration cited a report by the Trevor Project, which is a, a nonprofit LGBT advocacy organization. And it cited a report by the Trevor Project that argued that these interventions are necessary for young people in order to improve their mental and physical health outcomes. It's like, oh man, that's that's compelling. It's a nonprofit uh, that does like nonpartisan, objective, fact-based research. Well, the Trevor Project has received tens of thousands of dollars from from AbbVie Foundation, which is the uh, the giving arm of AbbVie Pharmaceuticals, which, like I you know laid out, makes Lupron, which is used as part of the transition sequence. So you you kind of see this this cycle of, I'm sure the people at the Trevor Project really believe it uh, in this stuff. But they're also getting tons of money to say it, so that helps, right? And then it it, it totally belies the idea that that um, that this is a totally grassroots thing. Uh, that these people are just kind of the scrappy underdogs of our time. You have the the White House is endorsing this stuff, yeah. and and like and Biden a few days ago when signing the uh, the inaccurately named Respect for Marriage law, uh, he said that. Uh, we need to to do something about these these laws in the states that are targeting trans youth. Like it's a it's a complete inversion of of reality. Um, that again, these the, the the ideologues, the ones that are pushing this stuff, the interest groups, they're actually kind of the the, the underfunded, you know, uh, skeleton crew that's taking on like the big, well funded bigots like us. So I, I want to talk about a couple things there that you hit because because uh, there's a couple important things there I think first you talked about the Trevor Project and the, kind of their influence and if I I believe the uh, Matt Damon clone who steals women's uh, yes. clothes was also <laughs> a member of the Trevor Project or worked for them in some capacity yeah. Yeah, yeah. before becoming like an official in like nuclear waste disposal. Uh, yep. For the Biden administration, which is really fascinating, I think, because at the same time, we look at a guy like Yul Roth over at Twitter, who did a lot of research in like, you know, uh, whether or not minors should be on Grindr uh, as like a graduate thesis. And somehow that person is qualified to like censor the president of the United States. It seems you know, I, I'm, I'm going to Charlie Day here for a moment. I'm going to I'm going to throw the you know all the charts up here and and connect the the red lines. It but it seems like there's a very weird pattern of people who are plugged in to certain levels of activism or activism for this movement, having access to extremely powerful positions that otherwise it doesn't seem like they would be qualified for with no other explanation than kind of the social cachet that comes with being activists in this movement. Am I a crazy person here? No, you're right. It's like an affirmative action program for crazy people. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, something that is um, something that you can glean from this, I think it's actually really fascinating and horrifying way is, is what a couple of well-positioned ideologues, and true believers can do. Like a handful of people in positions of power can fundamentally change uh, everything about this country. Like Roth is a great example of this, I think. 
you know, he wasn't the only, you know, crazy person at Twitter, but he was, you know, uh, one of the main ones, one of the chief ones. And he had a tremendous amount of influence over what we could see and say on the platform um, to the point where I think you could, you could argue accurately that it was, you know, able to influence the outcome of elections. Just a handful of, of, uh, of highly active true believers can really change the dynamic in this country uh, when they're put in somewhere like the White House or at the head of a platform like Twitter. Um, and, and again, the, any time that you attempt to, to you know, point out um, what it is they're doing or expose them or whatever, they go from being someone who holds a tremendous amount of power over you to, in an instant, being like a victim. Like Roth right now claims to be in hiding and fearing for his life and safety uh, because people have pointed out that he wrote in his PhD dissertation that, that basically it's such a ridiculous, the, the counter argument to people like me is ridiculous because basically on one hand, Roth documents his use of Grindr. Uh, and the funny thing about Grindr is, is that, well, everyone knows exactly what it is. It's a hookup app. Like, it's not like, like I met my wife on, um, Plenty of fish. This is a fun, fun fact about me, right? So, like, I met my wife on a on a dating website. Grinder is not a dating website. Like, everyone knows that Grinder is. Uh, Vice News has this really funny line about what Grinder is. Like, it uses GPS technology to locate the nearest person next to you who wants to hook up. And, and so, like, so Roth was using that and documenting it as part of his. There's a whole. There's a lot to unpack here, but that was his PhD dissertation. Um, and then he argues, well, miners are already using these platforms, not just Grindr, but they're already they're using platforms like Twitter and Facebook in a way that you would use Grindr to, to explore their sexuality, as, as you would say. So instead of driving them out, we should basically just accommodate different use cases. Like it's, it's inc- I, I wrote about this in my Substack, um, just the incredible amount of euphemisms that he uses, like youth ca- uh, use cases, exploring sexuality, stuff like that. Um, the young adult community, which increasingly accuse, uh, includes people under 18. Um, and but but that basically what Roth is saying is we we can't prevent people who are legally minors from interacting with these uh, uh, not just these ideas and content, but implicitly these people. So we should just accommodate their presence on these platforms. And you can see that what that looks like in reality is. Twitter has a massive child porn problem, uh, problem to the extent that in the last few years, they, Twitter actually could not un, uh, roll out its, it, they wanted to have a competitor program to uh, OnlyFans, basically to monetize adult content, but an internal team found that it would be basically really risky for them to do that because there is so much content on Twitter that can be described as child sexual exploitation. So I think that the issue was that you'd run the risk of like accidentally monetizing that. So because there's no way to like they, they didn't have the tools to verify, you know, who's if, are the people in this video over 18. And in some cases, uh, in the last year or so, uh, one family has sued Twitter because um, a kid who was under 18 uh, got involved in some like really shady stuff. And a video of him having sex with another minor ended up on Twitter and Twitter refused to take it down. And it was seen uh, hundreds of thousands of times. And the family is suing Twitter. There's a federal lawsuit out. Um, so again, you can kind of see that that um, what these ideas look like when they go from being just euphemisms that we giggle at to actual policy. You're talking about double mastectomies, about removing a boy's testicle and penis, uh, testicles and penis, or the proliferation of like child porn on Twitter. Like the, the reality is always much more horrific than these goofy euphemisms that we hear from, from these people. Yeah. And like you, you talked about uh, earlier in our discussion, it's always through this process of it's not happening. It's not real. You don't need to worry about it until you hit a critical mass of it happening. And then it's, well, of course it's happening. And now we have to create some safe way, some kind of exception, some yes, kind of allowance right. for, it, for it to continue to occur. Yeah. They, they do this over and over again. Right. And the whole time they're mocking the people who warned about it the entire time. This is a very common. And actually I just did a piece on this that should probably be out in the blaze here in the next in the next few hours uh, about 
coding the culture war as low class, coding people who would warn yes. about this stuff as ridiculous. Oh, this isn't really happening. You're so foolish for noticing this slippery slopes, not real that, you know, there, there's no logical consequence for this thing happening, waiting until you get a critical mass of it happening and then saying, Oh yes, of course we are. We always knew this was going to happen. Actually, it's great that it's happening. This is what everybody wanted the whole time. Right. And just no. shaming anyone who dares to notice, uh, you know, like no. you said, the, 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 attempts to just scream bigot at anyone who might point out the very obvious and horrific stuff that's going on has been really effective. But, you know, obviously we're hoping that that's coming to an end. And I think there are, there are signs showing that, you know, there is a diminishing return on how often you can kind of run through this tactic. But the other thing I wanted to touch on that you, you mentioned there when you were talking is the embrace by the white house of this stuff, right? Joe Biden, who was like, you know, 15 years ago talking about how you didn't really need a constitutional amendment to protect marriage because it was already law and you were never, ever going to see someone redefine marriage. Don't be ridiculous is now standing at the podium of the white house talking about the importance of like getting rid of laws that protect children from mutilation. Yeah. I've said this many times on Twitter and, and it's already come true this is going to be used to separate children from parents. This is going to be used to punish yeah. wrong thinkers and strip them of their children. And I think it's really clear that the white house and the, and, and the left is planning to do this. They're they're They are going to eventually mobilize in a way that makes sure to punish anybody who kind of disagrees with the regime by, by making sure that this civil rights issue of protecting trans kids is used to strip, you know, and to be clear, there are no trans kids. That's another thing. Uh, but 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 will be used to strip parents of their rights. And yeah. so I think it's a lot of Republicans are really uncomfortable. A lot of conservatives are still uncomfortable with saying things like this stuff needs to be illegal. There, there needs to be criminal penalties. Uh, we see a lot of people, even people on you know the so-called new right. Who are trying oh, yeah. to wave people away from this? Oh, it's not. It's a. It's nothing. The left isn't really pushing this stuff. You should be focusing on. I don't know labor relations or something. Like I see a. I see a lot of this from people yeah. who are supposed to be very influential in kind of yeah. new movements. And uh, this stuff you know, it needs to be taken very very seriously. These people yeah. will try to smuggle this stuff in the back door again if possible. They're pushing very hard for it. And I, I think people need to become very comfortable with saying this stuff is, is, should be illegal. There should be incredibly serious criminal penalties for this stuff. And there should be no retreat, retreat from that position. Yeah. Well, it's funny because you, in moments of clarity, will hear the left say what they really, what they really think. And early on with Elon taking over Twitter, there was this tweet from a leftist who said something like, I get why Elon hates the left. We we took his wife and transed his daughter. Yeah. Transed one of his kids. I don't know if it was daughter or son. Yeah. Um, but it was a moment where it was like, wow, they actually are like this person is admitting what we all say. Uh, that they they understand that the things that they want are simply horrific to us. Like that she's literally bragging about you know taking someone's child and and basically brainwashing them and, and mutilating them. And she understands that how horrific that must be for a parent. And it's just like, I, I, I actually have so much more respect for that person uh, than, than the people that lie to me. It's like, I get it. Like, because it, it is an act of war on a parent, yeah, right? That's exactly right. Um, no, it's, I, and like I said, I appreciate those moments of clarity. But, but I, and I think, again, one of the things that I, I draw to my report is that, um, you just have to pay attention to these people and, and their moments of honesty. Uh, there's a uh, there's a doctor, and if you hear me not naming doctors specifically, it's because there are so many different doctors and drugs in my report that I I don't want to like give you a wrong name and then you go in there and look at it and you you realize that I, I misnamed the person. Ever. It's all it's all in there. Just read it. But there's a doctor um, who was at a conference. Um, and she, this, this is a fairly recent conference in the last five years or so. And, and uh, in the audience are these different physicians and psychologists. And a, a person asks, well, what happens if a, a child is recommended um, for, you know, beginning the process of transitioning? And we have a parent that doesn't want to go along. 
And so this doctor answers very frankly and says on several occasions, I've had to deal with what she describes as recalcitrant, recalcitrant parents. And she says, it's not my first line, not in other words, not my first option, but she says, I will get the courts involved. Yeah. And, and then an, another doctor who's also on the stage uh, chimes in and says, yeah, they're, they're, um, she says, we've also had to deal with this in the state that she lives. And she says, um, we're spending a lot more time these days talking to courts and social workers. Um, she says, we're, we're teaching judges what transgenderism is. So, that, so basically, by the time that you get to the court, the judge is not on your side because now the judge has already been armed by this person with a PhD, right, who works for like a prestigious clinic and is associated with like, you know, some prestigious university um, has, and has told them that transgender, uh, the transitioning is life-saving. And so like you, you've already lost by the time that you get into the court. And Pedro, uh, sorry, uh, one second. I know you're a Sam Francis guy. Have you read Leviathan and its enemies? It's been a long time. Okay. Uh, why? Well, because because Francis specifically talks about this, about how the managerial elite basically hijacked the justice system yes. because yeah. yes. there's because judges basically become unable to make rulings without the expertise of the yes. managerial elite. Yes. And so anyone who controls them, therefore, de facto controls the justice system because yes. no judge would go against basically the best practices and advice of sure. someone who is supposed to have expertise in an area. Yes. So if you generate the idea of expertise and and uh, can the managerial elite in the area of transgenderism, then you can hijack all of the court process that surrounds it because all the experts will already be on your side and they'll inform all the positions of the judges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's terrifying, right? And but but here's the the kicker though is that the first doctor, the one that says that we've I've had to do this personally uh, numerous times, getting the courts involved. She conducted research into um, medical interventions for trans youth, and she actually authored a study that was funded with NIH money that argues that uh, girls as young as 13 um, should have access to mastectomies as part of transitioning. So again, you don't get to opt out. Like she's doing that research. It, it's, it's incredible, right? Um, she's doing that research with your money. And if your kid for some, you know, unfortunate reason decides that they're trans one day uh, trans one day because of something they saw on tv or heard, or heard from a peer um and you end up in court that that judge's head has been filled by things uh and, and can like cite studies that were made by this doctor like you so you really see that there is no opting out of this issue and and you can roll your eyes at it and think that it's you know coded for like low class americans and whatever uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that it's happening and it's going to get worse. And I think that, I mean, there are so many other elements to this I mean, uh, that that I, I only touch on this stuff barely in my report because obviously I'm focusing on the more structural aspect of this. But I think a person that can that can be convinced that um, a, a person that, that can be convinced that if they take enough drugs and, and subject themselves to to, to mutilations um, can can you know fundamentally change their identity is a person that is completely unmoored from reality and is therefore easy to control. Yeah. Uh, it's a person that ultimately has no agency and the ideal subject of, of the modern total state, you know, uh, and you can see this also in their consumer behavior. Um, th there is such a thing called uh, com compensatory consumption. And I talk about this um, and I cite a, a Chinese scholar who, who notes that, that, Compensatory consumption is this, this behavior where you react to perceived threats by spending money. So someone says, you know, like Marjorie Taylor Greene wants to erase trans people. And, and then you see a, a, a product that's advertised specifically to trans people, like makeup or like a pair of socks or whatever. That person who, who feels like they're being put upon um, is, is much more likely than someone who's not trans or whatever to, to buy that product. So it's they're extremely easy to manipulate and control. And it, which again is fantastic if you have something to sell or if you have a you know a, a country to subjugate. Yeah, a, a woke capital 
is after your kids because if they can completely deracinate them and completely strip them of identity, they become the perfect consumer and they become the perfect widget in any given per, uh, corporate cog, right? They can be sold anything. They can, they, they can wear those identities and discard them each time having to rebuy everything. They can be demand, you know, demands can be made to them at every moment uh, when it comes to working and that kind of thing, because they have no ties to family or culture or faith or anything that might inhibit their ability to 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 constantly have no other devotion but to the corporation. Yeah, there's a large interest. There's there's a reason that co that corporations are more than happy to immediately plug kind of into uh, into this giant leviathan because it, it, there is a massive amount of profits. Not again on just on the medical end or just on the patronage end, but also in the corporate end for all this mm -hmm. stuff. And so, yeah, I think it is. Um, I think you're right about that. Uh, guys, we're going to get to the uh, Super Chats here in a second. So if you have any questions for myself or Pedro, go ahead and drop them there. I see we've already got a few. But uh, while we're getting ready for that, Pedro, can you go ahead and tell people kind of where to find you if you've got anything big coming up they should be looking for? Yeah. So I'm on social media pretty much everywhere under the same handle, uh, E-M-E-R-I-T-I-C-U-S, Meriticus. My Substack. Uh, is at contra.substack.com. I, I send out roundups of my work. I, I send out stuff as I publish it elsewhere. It's kind of like a hub for everything I do. And I've got a, a column at chroniclesmagazine.org. And um, that's really it. I, I really, um, I wrote this report for two people. And it, again, it's at americanprinciplesproject.org. I wrote it for, um, on the one hand, people who are in a position to do something about it. So uh, policy, basically policy people. Um, and on the other hand, for people that kind of want to arm themselves um, with, you know, with, I, I hate to use the F word here, facts, because it, it's so overused, right? Like facts and logic, facts and logic. But I, I think it, those things matter for, for people who are kind of like, that they feel that something is fundamentally wrong. Um, with, and that somehow this issue is much more important that they're being told by the left or right but they don't really know why that is. Like I wrote this report for people like you. Um, so yeah, I, I really encourage you to, to check it out because um, it, it's it's designed to be comprehensive, but also concise, you know, 10,000 words, it, it's it's readable and it's not, a, it's written almost like a novel, not a boring white paper, so. Yeah, like I said, uh, there's, there's a lot of sensational stuff out there. It's it's very easy to find it, but it is very valuable to have those receipts and have them laid out in a way that makes sense and people can reference it because, like you said, it doesn't convince everybody. There are the diehards who will just stare this stuff in the face and say, whatever, I don't care. It's not happening or it's not true or it's good anyway, and, and they'll just ignore it. But there are those people who are on the fence or there are those people who are skeptical and saying, "Is okay, maybe everything's not right, but is is maybe these people are being hyperbolic. Maybe there's there's no real thing behind this. But having a report like yours that lays it out in a very concise way, makes it very easy to follow, makes it easy for people to understand, and really does show the goods, I, th I think is, is essential. So I'm really glad uh, that you ended up doing that. Uh, also, guys, before we get started with the Super Chats, if you uh, haven't already, uh, the show is now on all the podcast platforms. Uh, so if you want to go over there and subscribe on places like iTunes or Spotify, really appreciate if you go ahead and leave a rate and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a review that really helps everything. Uh, appreciate that from you guys here. So let's see. We've got uh, Nurkesh here for $10. Thank you very much, sir. He said, I did, he, did a video breaking down genderqueer two years ago. The book is tragically more revealing than the author intended. It's clear she's on the spectrum as misguided as a kid, which seems fairly common. Yeah, I'm not sure, of course, about that aspect, but I do know that this book is really horrific. I think parents have been banned specifically from like showing or reading parts of it during school board meetings due to the graphic nature of it. So it's it's so graphic it can't be read out at a meeting of adults. <laughs> so but, graphic it can't be read by adults, but yes. but it's but it's targeted at children. Yeah, it's essential, right? They, they don't yeah. just say it's <laughs> it, it's essential. It has to be in the children must have access to this, right? Yeah. Uh, it really really shows you where these people are at. So it's good to have people like Nurkesh doing 
you know, showing what that's like, because I, again, I think a lot of people just don't believe this. You, you got an okay, crazy person. And again, this is what we talked about with the, with the coding is low class. This is always how people treat this stuff. Oh, okay. Crazy person. Yo, you've got this conspiracy theory. You've got this slippery slope nonsense. One thing's going to logically lead to another. And all of a sudden, yeah, kids are going to get, you know, transitioned to 12. I mean, we saw so many times people lying about this, right? Oh, we don't give puberty blockers to kids that young. Oh, we don't transition. No one under, you know, 16 or 18 gets a yep. transition, right? And then we see reports coming out celebrating the fact that 13 year olds are getting it. We know they're lying. They're lying all the time. And if, at, at this point, if you fall for the that stuff and you're kind of aware of it, that's on you. You know, like you've got to, yep. you've got to be more yep. resistant to this stuff. You can't let the name calling, you can't let the, the low class coding, you can't let this stuff dissuade you from from looking the truth because again this stuff is very difficult and it's totally understandable that people don't want to look at it. i don't want to look at it but we can't we can't turn away this stuff is happening to kids these are vulnerable people who are being uh, preyed upon by cynical actors even if they are true believers people who are wishing to do harm in in some way and you just can't ignore that yeah. we've got rcw here for five pounds thank you very much a uh, great guest. Uh, we'll see Pedro out. Hopefully he gets some think tank funding ASAP and actions are taken. Yeah, I mean, again, Pedro is all over the place. Uh, so it's doing great work. And I'm sure people will be working on or looking at the support. Like Pedro said, that was the purpose of it, right? Was yeah. to make sure that people yeah. who do take policy action are familiar with the facts yeah. of these issues. Well, and, and to be clear, uh, the American Principles Project, uh, they, they made me, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but they actually made me a senior fellow as part of this whole uh, initiative and it's been well received i mean the panel that i was in it's bizarre right because like i'm i'm originally from california and i live in ohio now i've never lived or worked in washington dc but i went to dc recently to do a panel um on the report and there was a guy from heritage there named jay richards and uh he, he was really impressed with it and basically said that he was going to kind of help uh, distribute it because he it, it's interesting to see that there are people in these more mainstream institutions that actually get it. You know, like I, I bashed heritage myself, but um, it, it kind of tells you that there is some change that's happening, even if it's kind of subtle, that people are waking up and seeing that actually this is an, ex this is an existential issue. Um, so, so it's been well received from what I've heard. And it, I have heard that it's making the offices and some or making the rounds in some congressional offices, which is good. It's good to hear. Cause um, yeah, I mean, it does feel like sometimes uh, like no one is is listening and just kind of shouting into the void. So it's nice when organizations like APP and even some allies at, at organizations like Heritage are saying, we hear you and, and we're going to help you get the message out. So, yeah. And, and I want to be clear for people. You are you are not crazy. You are right. Your your skepticism is real for established conservative organizations like you are completely legitimate in your concern of capture but i will say as i have now had the opportunity to interact with more of these than i had ever had before there is a surprising number of people kind of leaning in you know being like by the way i think some people are right about this stuff like i think you know like like i think kind of you guys out there who have been kicking this around for a while i i think we agree with you more than we, you know, like we see this, we want to take action on it. That doesn't mean, you know, that this is going to change overnight. That doesn't mean that you should start trusting every neocon think tank that's been sitting around the beltway. I'm not <laughs> yes. saying that at all, uh, but, but just for those who are, for those, you know, I, I get a lot of people tell me constant black pillar, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to deal the, the, the odd white pill here. Okay. I'm going to give you the bit of hope. Uh, the, don't, don't buy in. To, to all the mainstream conservative organizations necessarily. I'm not saying that, but there are, this is getting talked about. There are people who are listening to spheres that you wouldn't expect and they know things that you wouldn't expect them to know. And they talk about articles and thinkers and things you wouldn't expect them to talk about. That doesn't mean things change overnight, but it is like Pedro said, when you find people like that in those organizations, it's worth talking to them, right? Because these are people who do have far reaching contacts, that kind of thing. And in, even if, again, you can't give things your total trust, it does matter that people like that are listening. That means something. Yeah. 
Uh, I did see one person say something here that actually I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit. And if you don't want to talk about it, it's okay. Cause it was kind of off topic, no, it's okay. but I, I, but you've, you've mentioned it and we, we kind of back and forth and about it a little bit. People who are making public apologies oh. or making, making public uh, forgiveness yeah. to like their child's murders, because those people have to be, or be of like a particular level of diversity. This seems to be a thing that's coming up more and more often. And you yeah. have kind of blown up on about it a few times. Yeah. And I think we kind of have similar feelings about it. Do, yeah. do you want to share those a little bit? Yeah. Well, it, it, um, well, the example that I think is, is so illustrative, or it's the perfect example of this issue, is that the Molly Tibbetts killing, right? Uh, the dad not only told people to don't use Molly's death to push your, your racist immigration views, uh, but also what are Mexicans, if not better Iowans with better food? You know, like it was just the most bizarre eulogy. Like his daughter has just been murdered, uh, maybe sexually assaulted before she was murdered. Like that, that part is kind of unclear, uh, but she's been brutally murdered. Um, and your reaction is, Mexicans are better better than Iowans because they make delicious tacos. What is wrong with you? Yeah. Like I I I couldn't, it's just hard to like wrap your brain around that. And then you had the killing of Elijah DeWitt, uh, who is this this young kid who literally looks like a Chad meme. And he he had just spoken to a university about going to play football there when he was essentially executed in a Dave and Buster's parking lot on a date with his girlfriend, police said that they don't know what, what was said in this exchange before shots were fired. But they said it, that from the time that Elijah DeWitt encountered the people who would kill him, uh, it was like two seconds. So it's, it seems like this was planned. Right. Um, and the girlfriend and the parents all instantly forgave the killers. And the dad specifically said, we don't know their backgrounds. Like, we don't know their socioeconomic status. It's just, like, you can see that there's something deeply wrong with you. And, like, and of course, I forgive them. And then the latest thing was um, this white woman whose son, her five-year-old son, was snatched by this black guy who was – conservative media was calling him Somali. I mean, I'm sure that, like, his parents or his grandparents were from Somali, but he's, he's a black guy. Um in Minnesota, Mall of America, snatched this five-year-old kid and threw him off a balcony. And later he admitted to the authorities that he's, I was, he said, I was looking for someone to kill. And so he throws a five-year-old kid off the balcony and then like the kid has to go through emergency, like brain trauma surgery to save his life. And he has a skull fracture, broken arms, broken legs. You know, he's, he has this like harrowing recovery. And the mom is just like, I forgive the man that did this. And then in court, when he was sentenced, he was just totally remorseless, like no, no, no remorse, no regrets, nothing to say. And, uh, and, and like, every time I point this out, the reaction is always the same. It's like blue check pastors, uh, calling me like a, a fake Christian or something. And then like, I, I just, I don't respond. I just, I search through their tweets for the word racism or bigotry. And sure enough, it's like the systemic racism is, is in the church. Like Christians need to talk more about racism. It's like, okay, yeah. But the, the point is, is like, I, I, I get it. Like forgiveness can be a virtue. Um, and it, it obviously is an, a central aspect of, of Christian doctrine. But the, the point that I always make to people is that this is a very, it's not clear to me that forgiveness is, is actually the operative thing here. That It seems like there's something else and that, uh, yeah. that something else seems to be like, yeah. This kind of conditioning that white people have undergone that teaches them that they should just either be kind of indifferent or apathetic, uh, or certainly just let it go. It's not worth the trouble if, if you know, your attacker uh, has enough diversity points and you should certainly forgive them to avoid, you know, the social stigma that might come if you don't forgive them. So, it, so in other words, it's not really forgiveness. There's something else going on. And the other aspect of this is like, OK, I forgive you. You should still get the death penalty. Yeah. That I mean, like that's really how I feel, and historically, that's actually been a fairly Christian thing to do. There's like there are these apocryphal stories of like the conquistadors, you know, uh, baptizing uh, indigenous people before they came them, so that they're you know so that they're saved. Um, but but like 
my challenge to people that will tell me like, oh, you're a fake Christian because you don't believe in forgiveness. I'm like, okay, uh, I would forgive someone who tried to kill my kids or, you know, did kill them. It'd be really, really difficult. But I can bring myself to maybe say, I forgive you if they ask for it, which is already, that's already asking too much. That's part, that's, but that's what, yeah, that's a necessary part of forgiveness that people keep skipping over here. Yeah. 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 But so if you ask for it and death penalty and 99% of the people that are like, will attack me when I do this stuff, they don't support the death penalty. And, And they support, of course, like, you know, giving these these guys like another chance to get out of prison early so that they can reoffend and then kill someone else's kids. And so I mean that that's the the whole issue in a nutshell. So you know. Yeah, no, I I agree 100%. Like I'm sorry, but if you what you got out of Christianity is you forgive someone who murdered your child without them even bothering to ask, you do it publicly so you're performing for everyone, right? And you do it um and you do it to basically mitigate justice and let's not forget that justice is also essential part of what happens next then yeah you're you're not doing this like you said because you're motivated by your christianity or if you are you're what you're motivated by is a very deep perversion of christianity yeah. uh, that that's not what ha- what's happening here what's being what's happening is you're performing socially for a crowd right and then the, yeah. it's really horrific it's it's a terrible thing to see i remember a few years ago, and I'm going to get the the details wrong because it's kind of slipped my mind at this point, but there was a young boy who was like on his bike or something. And like some guy just like blasted him out of nowhere. And um, when the whole story broke, uh, the big thing was like the guy claimed or or a crowd or people around him, someone claimed that the kid might have said a racial slur. And so the whole time, Yes, exactly. The mom, the mom of this, this, this poor mother. And, and, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not bagging on her because it, who knows in that position. Right. But like this poor mother in that scenario is spending all of her time saying, oh no, my child wasn't a racist. As if that's the operative concern here. If that's the most important thing, like if, if he had been, oh, then it would have been okay, but he wasn't. So now we need to care. No, this is this is a horrific thing, and yeah, watching people sit around pretending like this is Christianity, like it's it's it's, it's horrible. It, it, yeah, I have the same reaction you do. All right, we got one. I got another uh, super chat there where we're talking. Um, Trey fifty Daniel for ten dollars. Thank you very much. Sir says uh, Yuri Bezmenov talks at length about ideolo- ideological subversion. It's how uh, uh, it's how once they get to this uh, consensus the people convinced of it can be presented with facts and still believe in the lie. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. If people have not seen the Yuri Bezmenov uh, videos, they're very good. They're, they're kind of famous on kind of the right wing, you know, they, they, they circulate through Twitter and YouTube all the time. So if you haven't seen those, you should check them out. It's a guy who was like in the, I believe he was in the Soviet union and, you know, he's talking about all the techniques that they use, but the, yeah, there's, there's something that like a lot of people are really uncomfortable with. And that's kind of why they look, lose in the scenario we're in that's really cutthroat and it's that a lot of truth uh, is only self-evident because it's like culturally contingent like you need the the culture and the values around that truth to make it self-evident um and if you don't have them then people will believe complete lies um the 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 kind of inevitability that the truth wins out has there's some validity to it but you have to understand that it's fighting through a lot of propaganda that that will bury it. You know, the truth is that the I believe a uh, zero HP Lovecraft did, did like a little uh, story about this. He said the you know the and he kind of lays it all out. But the the abbreviated version of it is you know the the boy who you know yells that neighbor has no clothes ends up you know uh, murdered. He ends up executed. Um, you know, the the story is not that everyone the shekel or the uh, the scales fall from their eyes and then the truth is seen. Um, instead what happens is that that kid is executed and, uh, just, just something to remember when you're expecting that just saying something that's obvious and true is going to win out because actually we've got a very, like we talked about multiple times here, a very concerted effort of propaganda that's made it to push really hard to make sure that, uh, truth, that obvious things aren't revealed and it's things like, since, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I was going to say, it's been a while since I read the allegory of the cave. But I'm pretty sure this is what happens, or or Plato says it, or Socrates rather says that it, it's 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 very likely that the person who exits the cave and then comes back and tells people 
were no in a cave. It. They just gets murdered. Yeah. Yeah, they would get they would be murdered because yeah. the truth would be so shocking and horrific to the, to the people that are only accustomed to seeing shadows that they would just react with anger and violence. Sure. So it's absolutely right. Uh, KS here uh, uh, for one ninety nine. Thank you very much. Says, but what can we do? Uh, about this other than complain it's a really good question right a lot of people have this frustration what can they do yeah well i i um, in my report uh i concluded by talking about this like sorry i just i keep i keep uh shilling my report go for Uh, it that's why we're here buddy (laughs) but in conclusion that's that's what i get to is that basically we need to create you're you're already seeing the states kind of take action, which I think is where a lot of the really interesting stuff can happen right now. Like you don't necessarily need control of the White House to start taking action. Like you can actually start doing this now, right? Uh, and I, I talk about stuff that we've seen in, in mainly in, in Texas and Florida uh, that goes beyond this ridiculous, like, well, we just want our, uh, our, our girl sports free of dudes. Like that's, you've already lost. Like if, yeah, <laughs> if that's, that's the right. line in the sand that you're drawing, you've lost. Like you, you've, you've already been defeated. But in in Texas and Florida, you're seeing like in in Texas, they're talking about investigating the off-brand usage and marketing of these drugs with regard to trans kids. And in Florida, you've seen uh, probably the most aggressive approach of any state in terms of taking on uh, transgenderism as an ideology. Um, But basically we need to create the legal infrastructure where it becomes impossible to like anyone who attempts to administer uh, medical intervention for so-called trans youth, or even like anyone who attempts to administer it uh, faces fines. Uh, They lose their license to practice medicine or they go to jail or all three. And the same, yes. And the same has to go for clinics. Like if clinics administer any aspect of these treatments, the, ideally, those clinics should also have uh, their ability to do anything revoked uh, and be open to legal liability. And then even going even further, and any organization or institution or individual or whatever that attempts to market these treatments to kids has, also, has to be open to uh, legal liability. Uh, I, I talk about this more uh, in, in smarter words and terms. Uh, and in and, and more detail in the conclusion of my report, but basically it needs to be like lobotomies or something. Like if you do, on the one hand, we regard it as, as quackery, as dangerous quackery. And on the other hand, uh, it, it becomes functionally impossible to perform any of this stuff legally in the United States. Um, and I mean, there, there, there are examples of this stuff, like obviously lobotomies, lobotomies are one. Um, it wasn't so long ago that uh, we had physicians and physicists who I always give this example because I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, accredited physicians and physicists believed that you could use radioactive radium to uh, improve your sexual health. So radium, um, it, most people know of, you know, radium girls, these women that would um, lick these paintbrushes and then paint with this radioactive material that would go in the dark. Mm. Uh, and, and they would have these horrible on what cancer, obviously, but also their, their jaws would basically just deteriorate. Um, well, we also uh, gave women radium suppositories. Um, and also we had these these things called radio endocrinators, basically these credit card sized things that we men would be told to tuck them under their scrotum when they go to sleep and that it would improve their their sexual performance. All it did was sterilize them, just like transgenderism. Um, but for a time, accredited physicians and physicists were pushing this stuff. Now, if someone did that, they would not be allowed to practice medicine and they would probably go to jail. And that's ultimately the end goal for me for mm-hmm. transgenderism. And, and there are concrete policy steps that we can do now, uh, which is again, why I wrote the report. So. Absolutely. Uh, Kit's been here to help me out. Uh, the the name of the kid was Cannon Hinton. Thank you very much. Yes, that was the the kid who was yeah. killed a few years ago. And then um, uh, Mike Farron here says, same with the Grand Inquisitor. Yeah, that's another great example. Dostoevsky, the uh, brothers Kumarzov, the great the Grand Inquisitor, uh, did. Doesn't matter if Christ comes back, he has to hide the truth uh, to kind of keep things going here. Uh, one more super chat came up. Uh, Alexandra, sorry, I'm going to butcher this. Ostrowski, Ostrowska, uh, for 50 of whatever they have in Poland. 
uh, as a Polish, thank you very much, as a Polish observer of American affairs, I wonder if Americans realize how far general radicals have pushed their insanity. People in my country simply don't believe me when I tell them what's happening. Yeah, it, it sounds like a horror story. It sounds like an absolutely ridiculous made up thing, um, which is why I think so much of it, they get away with so much because who, who would believe this, right? I think I think your, your most fervent, uh, 1980s Southern Baptist grandma who was talking about the fire and brimstone that would follow could not have imagined uh, us yep. being where we are. And so, yeah, it's very easy uh, for, for that to, you know, to seem absolutely insane for people not to believe, which again is good. That's why you have people like Pedro put these reports together, have the receipts so that when someone says, no, that's insane, there's no way you're making that up. You can go right to it and you know the truth. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Once again, make sure to check out all of Pedro's stuff. If you're new here, of course, make sure to subscribe. Again, if you want to go ahead and check out uh, the podcast, really appreciate that rating and that review. And like I said, I should have a new piece up on the blaze here soon. It may already be up while we've been talking. I'm not sure. I'll have to check here in a second. Thanks, everyone, for coming by. We had some great questions, great discussion. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.